My name is Christy. You've already heard about me this morning, but anyway, work for UTA coordinating mobility for the urbanized areas. Um, so, what we do at our department, we manage FTA 5310 funds on behalf of the federal government. We're the direct recipient, and so we manage those funds. We award funds, help award funds. I won't say we would award them. We are helped by our local coordinating councils to award funds into the community to help with specialized transportation. And so because of that, we have to manage those funds. And Alica manages those funds for me. So in our department, there's myself, I try to, I'm the coordinating mobility manager, I try to do the management of things and projects, because I really like to do projects. Mostly I'm a project manager, so I try to do those kinds of things. Um, I try to help out with some procurement and other things with grants, so because a lot of times it can get overwhelming, we do a lot, it's a lot of upkeep. Alica is the main point of all knowledge for the 5310 program for the urbanized area. Um, she has a lot of experience. So Alica started with our department, what was it? When did you, how 2015. Long? 2015 is an intern with Holly. No, wait, that's, is that right? I don't know. So I think that's right. Quite a few years ago. She started as an intern. 2017? Holly used to be in her position. 2017, sorry. Um, so Holly helped sort of train and break poor Alka into the grant arena that I don't know that that's what she wanted to do, but but she learned it. Alka has some really great talents. Um, she is very detail oriented, which you have to be with grants then everything matters, especially the numbers. Uh, we are protecting federal funds, so it's a big deal. And she also has become, I like to call it the for forensic accountant <laughs> at our organization. She, she has to hunt down, we have this mythical thing called JBE where we work. Um, that's where we try, and we track funds in this. Alka, eventually figures out what's happened, where the money's gone, because sometimes things don't get pulled down from where they're supposed to. So because she's so detail-oriented and she really gets to the bottom of things, and that really saves our grant program. Um, so yeah, she's worked for, for us for quite a few years. She was an intern, then became a permanent employee. I do want to mention that she, her urban ecology was her bachelor's degree, but she got a master's degree in grant writing management and evaluation. So she knows her stuff. Um, she's really invested in what we do. She also is a secretary on WTS, <clears throat> which is a women in transportation organization, but they emphasize it's a nonprofit um, dedicated to creating more diverse, inclusive, and equitable transportation industry for global advancement of women. So she's very involved with that too. Um, so we, I just wanted to talk her up because I really appreciate how <laughs> she does such a great job. And, and uh, Trista used to help her, now it's Jared. So if you do anything with us, Jared is now our compliance officer. And Trista does some of the things I used to do. Um, she does some grant stuff, but she works with our local coordinating council. So that's sort of our group. But Alec is the, the in charge of the grant, so you'll get really good information from her today. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Am I too close? Okay. Um, don't worry, I'm not giving you a lecture on accounting. So last year when I did this, I talked a lot about the 5310 program and we just had recipients and I mostly just answered questions, but I asked them what would be most helpful and I got a lot of feedback about grant writing. So because we have an upcoming application, I wanna focus on grant writing. I know you had a lecture yesterday on grant writing. That was a little more big picture, a little transit oriented, like transit organization, engineering, construction projects. I'm gonna go smaller, nonprofit focused. We're writing grants um, for smaller pots, for operations capital. Maybe you're writing grants to foundations. We'll talk about that stuff. Um, So first off, Sherry introduced me, so let me go past this. But briefly, just for those who might not know, most of you look like our subrecipients, so that's good. Um, the 5310 Formula Grant Program. Sorry, I should spit my cough drop out, sorry. There we go, now I can talk. <clears throat> um, UTA manages the urbanized areas for the 5310, and UDOT does the rural. So they manage it a little differently than we do. 
We offer capital projects and operations funding projects. Our goal is to help bridge gaps in transportation service for seniors and people with disabilities. And the formula fund apportionments are based on the population in each urbanized area. Utah has three large urbanized areas, Salt Lake, Provo Orem, and the Layton Ogden area. <laughs> Layton Ogden. Oh, I had it right there, but you know. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna briefly talk about program overview if needed. I think most of you are pretty aware of our program. We're gonna talk about timeline of the funding opportunity that's upcoming, um, how you can prep for that grant application. I know a lot of you are thrown into grants just like I was. You, you didn't plan on writing grants and you find yourself writing grants. So I'm gonna talk about how you can prepare yourself the best for that. Salt Lake City urbanized area is the most competitive. So if you're in that urbanized area, you've got to beef up your application. We're getting more and more applications every year. The other two UZAs are a little bit less competitive, but you should still have a really strong application or else you might not get everything you're asking for. We're also going to review the application questions that you might see um, and some required documentation. And um, I don't think I go too much into the scoring, but I will give you some tips on a strong application. So 5310 grant program, you might recognize this face. <laughs> There's Holly, she used to manage the 5310 grant program. So this is an old picture of Holly and Lopini from United Way. So raise your hand if you are a subrecipient already of 5310, just so I can kind of scan the room. Perfect, okay. So do you have any questions before we get into it about general eligibility? Well, no, because you're all, I'm gonna skip all that then. I don't wanna waste your time, we're a little behind. So just briefly, if you can see this, when we get the funding apportionments and the FTA says, this is how much money you're gonna get for each urbanized area for this application cycle, 10% um, of that goes to UTA to pay our salaries for managing the program. 35% or less goes to operations and we have to put at least 55% towards capital projects. <clears throat> so just so you know, are aware of how that works. Um, the timeline for the 2023 and 2024 application cycle, because we are, continuing to do the two-year application cycle. So we already know the apportionments for 2023, but we don't yet know 2024. When we know that, we will let you know. <laughs> the, can you read this? Yeah, notice of funding goes out December 15th. That is when we post that the funding is available, what it's going to be, what the apportionments are for 2024, on our website and then we send it out to the local coordinated councils and we'll talk about it at the LCC meetings. Then we will do an application workshop the first week of January. You have to attend the workshop in order to submit your pre um, The workshop we will go over like how to use Zoom grants, how to submit your pre-application so you can't miss that. Uh, then the pre-application is due January 15th this is also known as your letter of intent. It used to be more of a formal letter that you mail in and say, this is what I'm applying for. You might do that still for foundations and things like that, but a lot of big grants have moved digital. So you will fill out your pre-application online. This allows us to see what you intend to apply for, and we will let you know if you're, still, if you're eligible to submit the full application. Then the full application opens January 20th, and the application review process, the whole process, so that's the initial review, and then we tell you if you need any corrections and we'll open it, and then the scoring and ranking, and then look, so all of that is from February to the end of March. 
then the review and awards are from April, April to June. <clears throat> so that's just a brief timeline for you. Let me take it. Um, I don't know yet. I, I'll try probably to do both, if possible. This one, CC's. Yes. 2023-2024, is that referring to federal fiscal year? Yes. Okay, how does scoring work? The application reviewers are people in my office. We review the application and score the projects individually. Then we share scores with each other and discuss, you know, if we're close and if we agree. Then we might reach out to you and let you know if there's an issue with your application, if we need you to fix something, if you're missing an important document. Um, but we can't tell you exactly what to write. <laughs> Uh, scores are then given to our GMAT. They are the final decision makers and they cannot be subrecipients. So usually we have a representative from each urbanized area. Um, and sorry. Hey, Trista. Yeah. Never mind. <laughs> I need a tissue. Do you have anything? Does anyone have anything? Sorry about that. Um, Reviewers may reach out, okay, I already said that. So the GMAT, then we give them the scores, they review it, they're the final decision makers. We'll show them the program of projects and what we suggest to fund. And then if they wanna make changes at that point, they can. Um, and then they also review, so they review your application score, your risk assessment scores and then our funding suggestions. And then at the April LCCs, agencies have an opportunity to respond to any questions from the GMAT. You get a chance to talk about your projects and you know, put out there more information, which is really cool. Not a lot of application processes allow you to speak to your project. Um, so that is a vital LCC to come to. Some people like to do a little like presentation. You don't have to. It's totally up to you, but it gives a chance for the GMAT to ask you questions about your application. And then they will make the final funding decisions. So there's a lot of steps in that decision-making process before awards are given out. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Then I briefly want to touch on the local coordinated transportation plans because these are so important for your application. What are they and why are they important? They are plans developed by your urbanized areas in the local coordinated council meetings. And in that plan, um, you decide, well, the local coordinated councils decide what projects are most important to that area and what they want to fund first, right? So your project must fit into your locally coordinated transportation plan. Your project must address the gaps listed and identified in that plan. And your project must also address strategies that are listed in that plan. So you want to read that, have it on hand when you're writing your grant and refer to it when answering your questions. Make sure you list and address the specific goals, gaps, and objectives that are in that. So I would use that as a guide. Try to mimic some of the language in that when you're answering questions that have to do with the plan. <clears throat> that will help you a lot. Okay, so before you begin your grant application, and this, you know, this is for our application, but I'm also kind of going broad. So any applications that you are writing, always review the eligibility requirements first. Make sure you're eligible. Um, review your mission, vision, and goals. Do they align with your funder's mission, vision, and goals? Will your project align with the goals of the local coordinated council plan? And if you're writing an application for something else, they might also 
want your projects to fit into whatever their plan that they have is. Will your project address gaps? How will you measure a successful project? Consider hiring a grant writer. I know a lot of agencies do it in house, but as these grant fundings become more competitive, you wanna make sure that you either have someone on staff that can write the grant for you, or you can always hire a consultant to write the grant for you, but you can never use grant funding to pay for a grant writer. You can use grant fundings to pay for a grant manager after the fact, but grant funding can never be used to pay for anything that happened before your grant was awarded. Make sure you read the entire application package, especially for federal grants. Um, yesterday in the grant lecture, he was talking about those big grants like RAISE and, and things like that, and he talked about the fact sheets and reading the NOFO. That is very important for any application. Just read the whole thing before you even start so that you know what you need. Um, you can also look at past projects that maybe a foundation or a grant program has funded and make sure that your project fits into those. Review what documents are required for the types of grants that you want. And then one of the most important things is defining your project. Be sure that you have a clear understanding between your project and your overall agency. Because a lot of times I get questions or I see in a grant application that people are just talking about what their agency as a whole does. Maybe that's good for you know the question like, please describe your agency and what services you provide. But when you get down more into your application, you want to be specific to the project, the project that this grant is funding. Um, two years of operations to run a transportation service, that's a project. Um, a bus to provide seniors rides to the hospital, that's a project, okay? It has a time frame, it has goals, it must have measurements, a beginning and an end. How much can you ask for and is it enough for your expenses? Some grants have a minimum and a maximum that you can ask for, but also look at your budget. Make sure that, and I might repeat some of these things a lot as I go through. How are we looking? 930. Okay, this part's important. Documents to prepare before applying for any grant. I have a little meme for you. When a funder asks to give your mission, history, and outcomes in 100 words or less. This is reasonable. Watch those character limits. Okay, so you always, always wanna start with your agency mission and statement. Make sure you have that ready. Certificate of incorporation. Your 501c3 letter or other tax exempt proof for those nonprofits out there. Your employer identification number, most Applications require that. Your UEI number, we used to use the DUNS number, now it's the UEI number, that is from SAM.gov. Your list of board members, annual record of board contributions, especially if you receive over 80% federal funding. Your organization chart, job descriptions for all positions. Now, I don't mean all positions of your entire agency, that would be really long for some of you, but you know, if you're applying for a vehicle, your grant manager, your operations manager, your fleet manager, your drivers, have all that. <clears throat> the number of full-time, part-time, and volunteer staff, current resumes of managers and key staff, brief bios of key staff, and your overall organization budget and individual program budgets. And I can provide these slides for you if you want to use this as a cheat sheet. Okay. Other things, auditor's report, your annual report, list of current funding sources and potential sources of your matching funds, floor plan if you have a public facility where clients access, this can also help you address ADA, and if your facility is ADA um, accessible. Personnel policies and procedures, a disaster plan. This is not required by most funders, 
but we've all seen since COVID that a disaster plan is not a bad idea. It can enhance your reputation as a reliable and well-prepared organization to show that you are ready in case of a disaster, especially when it comes to funding sources. It's useful to have also a boilerplate grant application on hand. Um, I would just keep that like in a folder with all this stuff, just so when you're ready to write a grant, you can grab that folder. Your boilerplate should have your organization's history, maybe a list of your, the current programs and projects you have, the community you serve, stuff like that that you know is gonna be asked in any grant application. Then you can just copy, paste, kind of change it. A list of existing partnerships, letters of agreements and memorandums of understanding. Any recent needs assessment, risk assessment, program evaluation reports, site visit reports, examples of forms and procedures, that kind of thing. And any recent publicity or list of maybe awards that your agency has received for certain programs. I know at UTA, like, we always list our accounting awards in our grant. It, that's important to know. Okay, grant considerations. We only fund those proposals we can understand. Yeah, remember that. <laughs> so consider hiring a grant writer. They can take the pressure off of you and increase the chances that your application will be approved. Remember, you usually cannot use grant money to pay for a consultant, so budget on that. Um, Grant management. Different types of grants will require different levels of management, tracking, and evaluation. Federal grants have the most management requirements of any other grants, especially compared to foundation grants. If most of your grants are foundation and then you go apply for a federal grant and you've never done that before, read the requirements, read the reporting requirements, understand what you're getting into before you get those funds you might want to hire someone to help you with that. And most grants, you can use some money for that. Even some federal grants even require you to use a percentage of the funding to help with the management and evaluation side. <clears throat> Always consider your risk level when applying for new grants. What is your risk level? Has your agency been flagged as high risk by any, any uh, other agencies or maybe an internal audit can you lower your risk prior to applying for funding and show that to the funder why is your risk high and what can you do to lower it these are important questions to think about also consider capacity i have been really pushing that at uta too like why don't we really evaluate our capacity before we start applying for more funding can we, do we have enough staff to manage more funding? Um, some agencies make the mistake of thinking of grants as seeds, right? And if I plant as many as I can, I'll give back the most money that I can. And then they're like drowning in paperwork, you know, because you just took on too many grants. So that's really something to think about. Or maybe you, don't, you applied for so many grants and now you don't have the local match funding because you just applied for too many. So think about that. Um, staffing plan. Will you be hiring more staff to help with your project? Does your current staff have the experience and background needed to understand and meet the requirements of your grant? Be prepared to write a detailed staffing plan and have backups in case your grant manager doesn't work out or is sick. By backups, I mean on the application, don't just put one person. Right? What if they leave and then your grantor can't get a hold of you? And you, maybe you don't know that no one's turning in reports. That could get you in real trouble. So always have a backup. Uh-oh. No, I broke Clint's recording device. <laughs> Let me click that here. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so that's what I mean by backups. 
List more than one person on your staffing plan and your staffing table and Zoom grants. Budget. Writing a budget is the most important part. If you do not have a good overview and understanding of how much it will cost to complete your project, you may apply for too little or too much money. And if you don't spend all the money that you applied for, um, we used to carry over because we weren't getting enough applications years ago. So we would carry funds over. That's not really a problem anymore. We're getting so many applications, it's competitive. So we're not carrying funds over. If, you, if it passes the obligation period of your grant and you didn't spend your funds, we de-obligate those funds, which means we give them back to the federal government. We don't wanna do that. So don't apply for more funds than you can spend. And I don't really mean that for vehicles and things like that, but operations. Okay, so you need a good operations budget. You really need to think about how much is it really gonna cost for me to pay all this staff for a year or two years? How can I show that on paper to my funder? Is that hurting the next, uh, the next go around? It can, yeah, definitely. I've, also, I was talking to Ability First, and they were saying that they have a funder who is looking at how much money they gave them in the past and lowering how much they're allowed to apply for because they don't want you depending on them. So that's something to think about too. Some funders look at that and they say, oh, we gave you a lot of money in the past two years. You're only allowed to apply for 30% of that this year. So that can hurt you if you're banking on those grants. <clears throat> um, oh, yeah, let me go back to budget for a second. So speaking on that, funding diversification. Any organization that is over 30% federally funded is considered a risk, and any, any agency over 80% of federal funding is watched closely by the federal government. Um, you actually have to report publicly how much you're getting on the federal website if you receive over 80% federal. And remember for the 5310 grant, you must subtract any revenue that you're making from trips from your operations and you have to show that um, in your budget and on your payment reimbursement. Yes? Is that um, unit or is that just like patron pay for the What's an MTP unit? Sorry. Yes, that counts. That I think it depends. You can't, yeah, you have to remove it from your operations because you can't be double dipping for those funds. So yeah, let's say I have my operations budget is $100,000 and I'm getting another grant for operations. I have to subtract that from what I'm gonna bill another grant. Um, and then also if I'm charging for trips, donations do not count. So fundraising donations don't count. Writer or yeah, writer donations don't count. Donations never have to count against you as revenue. Grants, charging fees, anything like that, you have to count. <clears throat> you can't double bill for anything. Um, also remember to price out your preventive maintenance for your vehicles that you're applying for and apply for preventive maintenance. If you don't do that, you can still bill preventive maintenance as operations, but it's only covered at 50% in the 5310 grant. Whereas if you budgeted out, I'm gonna need this much money for preventive maintenance, you can get 80% on that. So consider that, include that in your application. Um, preventive maintenance on your vehicles. So any vehicles that serve your project, um, you can apply for preventive maintenance funds for. So oil changes, tires, so things I, like I, that. I, I incorporate that in the 80 not the, not with the vehicle. Yes, you can apply for it as preventive maintenance specifically, okay. and that is covered as a capital cost which is 80-20, if you run out of that fund or you don't have, or you didn't apply for that, you can bill it as an operations cost, but it will be covered at 50%. Isn't the maximum operating budget you can request a percentage of capital or no? 
Um, that's a good question. Are they, are they linked? The size of your capital request. Like, what if you don't request capital? Yeah. Can you still request? You can. Yes, you can. As long as your area is meeting that fifty-five percent going towards capital. Yes, Holly. So. That's a good question. We went back and forth on that for a while and we found as long as it's supporting your project, so if you're using those vehicles for 5310 purposes only and not personal purposes, yes. I didn't hear the question that you just answered. Okay, she asked um, if you have other vehicles in your fleet that are not 5310 funded, can you get preventive maintenance money for those vehicles? And the answer is, Yes, as long as those vehicles are only being used for your project and not personal purposes. Okay? Or maybe if it's a different project completely, like let's say I have a vehicle that's just Meals on Wheels and I didn't mention Meals on Wheels anywhere in my application, it's not part of my project, then I couldn't use that vehicle. But if I have another vehicle that I purchased myself in my fleet, um, but it's used for the same project purpose, then yes. Okay, and then rejection. I just want to say that in the grant world, rejection happens. Now in 5310, we try as much as possible to avoid that, but other grants, especially like foundation grants, rejection is to be expected. So don't see that as a failure. See it as an opportunity to improve your grant application. Reach out to that funder, reach out to that grantor and ask for a debrief. Um, something that I did when I was a grant developer at UTA was keep a, like a notepad and write down that debrief and then we would save it in a folder called debriefs. And then the next year when we go to apply for that grant again, we find our debrief from the last year what did the funder tell us we needed to improve on? And we have that ready to go. <clears throat> um, even if you are awarded everything that you asked for, you can still ask for a debrief. They can't show you all the scores and notes from the reviewers, but they can answer questions for you and they can tell you what areas you scored low on and how to improve that in the future. I've noticed a lot of our subrecipients don't do that. I've only had one or two that ask me for a debrief and they say it's very helpful. So definitely ask at the end of the application cycle. You can always set up a time with me and I can tell you what areas to improve. Okay, sorry. It's a lot of talking. Okay, and we're running out of time. I'm gonna to try to speed up a little bit. Evaluation, if you're a large agency, you can, should consider evaluating your projects and programs. If there are lots of them, you can also hire an evaluator to tell you how your projects and programs are doing. Site visit results can also be used to help evaluate your program, so use them to your advantage. Well executed and designed evaluations will tell you if you've been successful. Otherwise, how do you know if your programs are even achieving what your goals are? Well, they're having fun over there. <laughs> That's right. Grant writing is fun. I'm serious. It is. <laughs> okay, pre-application. We'll go through this real quick. This is all the stuff that UTA requires application that we review. Your mission, eligibility, your geographical service area, what urbanized area you're in, what congressional districts you're in, a short description of your project. Now by short description of your project, I don't mean your agency. What are you going to ask for in this application? That's all we need to know. What's your letter of intent? What do you intend to apply for? I'm gonna apply for two vehicles. Cool, thank you. You don't really need to put too much in there. <laughs> Don't write a novel. This is just the pre-application. We just want to know what are you intending to apply for so that we can make sure it's eligible. And if it's not, we tell you before you waste all your time writing that application, okay? 
Suspension or debarment. If you have been suspended or debarred for receiving and if you don't, we will find out on the SAM.gov website. So don't apply for federal funds if you have any of that. A suspension, I'm sure none of you are suspended or debarred, but a suspension comes down from the FTA or another federal agency and can be a year that you're not allowed to receive federal funds. And then a debarment means like never again, you're done. So I probably spelled that word wrong, but. Documents that are required for your pre-application, SAM registration, W-9, risk assessment. If you are a new agency and you don't have a risk assessment from us, we have you do a self-evaluation for your first risk assessment. And then once you become a subrecipient, we do our own risk assessment. This is something new that the federal government rolled out a few years ago. They really want us to evaluate risk and look at risk and they, in our last triennial review, asked us like, what questions do you ask? How do you evaluate risk? And they looked at our risk assessment and made sure that we are asking the right questions. So risk assessment is a huge part. We're going to try to incorporate it to have a heavier weight in your application process because that's what the federal government wants to see is that we're evaluating that before we just start handing out money, right? Your FAFADA checklist, um, that's basically asking like, do you receive more than 80% funding? How, many, how much money does your board get? If you're a small agency, you don't really have to worry about it, but you still have to fill it out. Tax exempt verification and your designation letter. Designation letter means like if you're designated by the governor to provide aging trips. Okay, Whew. I went through that fast. Application, this is the main application. Use an old application to prep. Read the entire thing. Collaborate using a shared document. That's what I like to do. I assign people to sections and then I say write something and then once I have all those sections filled, then I take that and I rewrite it in my own language. Watch for character limits. I keep saying that, especially for federal grants. That's very important. Avoid fluff or repetition too much, right? We, some, look at those character limits. If it's asking for a thousand words, that's probably an area you can go ahead and fluff up. But if it's like 100 characters or less, keep it very simple. Use the coordinated transportation plan to help feed into that grant. Have someone proofread before you submit. Pay attention to the points per question. Sometimes the uh, funders will put like, this is a 10 point question, you know, so that's an important one maybe. So pay attention to that. Um, answer every question and address every topic. Use subheaders that reflect the question. Use the funders language back to them. Um, I like to call that parroting. You're parroting back to the funder the language that they use because that's what they want to see. <clears throat> Oh, and small print. Some questions have small print underneath that says like, please use specific time frames. You better pay attention to that and put specific time frames. Okay, here's some example questions that I took from an, our last 5310 application. So we have about 10 more minutes-ish. So um, this is a question that you will probably see. Provide a brief description of your agency's transportation services or transportation related program, including eligibility requirements, if any. So that is a multi-part question, right? There's, it's asking for a lot in that question. So break it down. First, I would break it into two parts and I would answer the first question, describe my services. So let's say I have a foundation called Subs for Seniors that runs a Meals on Wheels deli service that provides meatball subs to seniors. That's my idea. <laughs> then I would describe, so I would say that. That's what my services are. How do I describe the second part of the question, my eligibility requirements? Subs for seniors provide services to anyone over 65 who receive less than $30,000 annually in Social Security. Seniors must apply by filling out an application online or on paper and may select one day a week to receive a meatball sub, which is delivered to their house by our volunteer drivers. Did I answer the question? It was a two-parter. 
Focus on the question. Then after you've completed your application, read it in its entirety, the whole application, to make sure it has flow and you're not repeating too much and that you're addressing everything. Then you can go back in and add your fluff, maybe fluff up some sections if you want. Sometimes less is more. Think about your audience. Think about the funder, what they want to hear. Um, next question. Describe how your project will meet one or more strategies identified in the coordinated plan. I picked this one because it had small print underneath and it says 10 points possible. The small print says provide detailed information about how your project will address the strategies identified in 1.1.1. It tells you what page to look at. Okay, I have to blow my nose again, sorry. <laughs> so if you read the small print, you can find the answers that you need. Oh, and I didn't. Yeah, answer that question as good as you can. So here's another meme for you. What my friends think I do, what my mom thinks I do, what program staff think I do, what my boss thinks I do, what I think I do, and then what I really do, that's a Microsoft Word word counter. <laughs> that's what we do. Pay attention to those word counts or character limits. Okay, last, we're running out of time. Um, the work plan is a section of your application that's really important. So pay attention to that. Have your staffing plan, implementation plan. I'm not going to describe each one since I don't have enough time. Um, what's that? <laughs> Technical capacity. Focus on your agency's capacity here, your ability to manage grants, your experience, what tools you have to assist you. Financial capacity. Talk about if you get a yearly audit, um, any finance awards, um, accounting tools you use, if you have an accountant, if you track grant funds separate from other revenue, how you follow general accounting principles, federal requirements, all of that good stuff. And then here's some required documents for the 5310 application. I already went over what you need in general, but these are what was required on the last one. So you'll probably see the same things on the future one. Your letter committing local match funds. This is different than your letter of partnerships. You need a letter from whoever you're getting local match funds saying, yes, we commit this funding. Who is designated to sign the grant agreement? Your most recent audit and any resolutions or findings. Your ADA compliance documentation. Pay attention to that request because sometimes people just up upload one thing. That's actually four documents that it's requesting. Your ADA plan, your ADA facility checklist, um, your ADA notice to the public, and I can't remember the last one. Title VI compliance documents, same thing. It's asking for three Title VI compliance documents. EEO statement on your website. Just do a screenshot. Driver training program with list of covered topics, which you can find the required list in your grant management guide, I think. Yeah. Workplace policies. It's going to ask for multiple workplace policies. Have those ready. FTA asset inventory and your fleet inventory. Those are separate. The FTA assets inventory is a specific format that the FTA requires that show your 5310 vehicles. If you have any vehicles that the lien has been released, you still need to put those on that list and just say that UTA doesn't have a lien on it anymore or it's not vested, I think. That I should change that. And then um, if it's disposed or you're disposing of it, you have to tell us in that sheet. And then your fleet inventory that you put into Zoom grants, that's like your full fleet. Um, and then your operating budget plan, and we could ask for more, so just be ready for those documents. Key considerations for nonprofits. Um, measuring impact is key for most funders. Um, I want to get you to think, move from a funder mentality, like, I, like they just want to give me money. They just want to give out money, right? 
to an investment mentality. I'm asking them to invest in my project and my agency. That helps you think about how to write it, right? You want them to invest in you. Why do they want to invest? Explain that. <laughs> Use SMART goals, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound. That's what funders want to see. Diversify your funding sources. Grant makers expect you to diversify funding and not rely on government or foundation funding, especially in times of economic downturn. Have a disaster plan. Diversify fundraising strategies, seek earned income, cultivating major donors, develop planned giving programs, use strategies such as social media and social entrepreneurship, think outside the box. If I run a seniors program, maybe I could find a foundation that wants to pay for something animal related. Well, I could have them fund for pets to come visit the seniors. Or maybe a funder who runs a program to address hunger can help with senior food costs. So think outside the box because you have to find funders and what they're going to fund that you can relate to your agency and maybe have projects in your agency that will help fund your overall operations. Be creative, flexible, willing to take some risks. Sometimes in fundraising, people don't want to take risks. And what, that, what I mean by that is you have to spend some money to make money. Sometimes you have to spend some money to throw an event that will bring people to it and they will donate. And every year you do that, more and more people will know about this and they will come. And you know, sometimes agencies, especially nonprofits, are holding on tight to their wallets. They don't want to spend for these types of, you know, events, but that's how you get out there in the community and that's how people become aware of what projects you're doing and what programs you have. <clears throat> how else will you bring donors to the table, right? Recruit and thank your volunteers so that they will come back. It's surprising how little some nonprofits pay attention to their volunteer programs. Someone at least should be assigned in your agency to oversee your volunteer program. You could even consider a volunteer appreciation day. Budget, budget, budget. Don't overstate or understate the amount of money you need to do the job. Some proposals review criteria that includes points for the appropriateness of your budget. Your budget also must be consistent with what you've said you would do. All right, hey, we're getting to the end, right on time. Tips and tricks. Turn it in early. Don't wait to the last day. Always have someone proofread. I like to have a thesaurus tab open. And if I'm like, oh, I keep saying the same word, I put it in the thesaurus and try to pick a different word. <laughs> so there's my tip. Um, after awards, ask your funder for a debrief. Save your notes for the next time you apply. If you had a risk assessment, review it. Try to find some concerns that the funder had and address those in your application, maybe in your technical capacity section or your staffing plan section. If you had a lot of overturn or if you scored poorly in the communication section, how are you gonna beef that up? How are you gonna improve your quarterly reports? Um, write out your whole application first. So I like to do that in a Word document or a Google Doc and then go in and copy and paste everything over when I'm ready to submit. Um, does anyone else have other tips in grant writing that they would like to share? No? <laughs> okay. I had gone to a grant writing workshop where one person said, pay attention and then if there's stuff you couldn't put in that box, find a way to put it in a different box. Yeah. I didn't know if that would be confusing or if that was a good tip. It's a good tip if it still answers the question in that section. So it depends on the application. If, if I had a section that was like, please describe your technical capacity, I wouldn't want to you know, start talking about how I clean my vehicles or something that's not really related to that. So yes and no. You know, make sure it makes sense. 
I would say read your application at the end um, and make sure that it makes sense and has a flow to it. As long as you answer the question, you know. Um, any other questions? Yes. Okay, what if you have a question that says 100 but you only put in like 50 words? If it really tells you to use 100, do you want to use 100 or 1,000? No, sometimes less is more. I would just say if it does give you that character space, feel free to elaborate. Um, like she said, like maybe you could add something that you weren't able to add in another section to that section, as long as it's related. Um, but don't fluff it too much just to try to meet that character space, because sometimes funders are looking at that and they're like, oh, this is so long, I don't want to read it. Or, or, oh, it's repeating what I already read up here, so I'm not gonna, even going to read that section. And if you had something important in there that maybe wasn't in that, I don't know. So. I don't know, use discretion. <laughs> it says a thousand, fill it. Fill it. Mm. Not always. I would say it depends. Because, yeah, sometimes funders, especially like foundation funders, they don't have a lot of time. Maybe they have a volunteer reading the applications, you know, and they're just skimming through it. So be aware of your funder and who's who you're addressing, I would say, is like the best thing for that. Um, like with the feds, if it's a federal one that I'm writing, I want to be very succinct and to the point because I know they don't really care about fluff. They want to see data, you know? They're like, how are you going to meet this goal? So I have a timelines, I have numbers when I'm writing a big federal grant like raise or a construction grant. So I don't put a lot of fluff in those. Um, so it just depends on the grant also. Yeah, that's a great strategy. Yeah. Anything else maybe I didn't cover? I haven't used it for grant writing, but it could be helpful, especially if you like have writer's block. I don't know. Try it. <laughs> Yeah, proofread it. <laughs> but it can go all over the place sometimes, so uh, just make sure. Oh, ouch, sorry. But remember, Chat ChatGPT doesn't know everything you know about your agency. So, you know, make sure you're using your knowledge to answer the question. And if you're a, hiring a grant consultant, Make sure that they have access to all the information that they're going to need to answer those questions. On the match, um, is there, I know they mentioned earlier on the federal piece, they're looking at changing that from the 50-50 to the 80-20? She was saying that that's a bill that they're trying to pass. I think it's in that rural. No. I thought she was saying it was just rural. It's just rural. It's going to be we'll see. I know, yeah. And that's why I mentioned the preventive maintenance piece. You can charge that as capital. Yeah, yeah. So that's helpful. Yeah, uh, I was just gonna say, after you've done your application, I heard and read that it's good to read it backwards. Oh. <laughs> grammar and oh. Yeah. Because a lot of times when I have a double word, but you kind of miss that as you're reading through in the right order. But if you read backwards, you'll catch all of those errors. Yeah. Or I just like to ask someone else, hey, do you have time to proofread this and make sure I didn't make any mistakes? Because sometimes when you've been staring at an application for two weeks, a month, yeah, you, your brain just starts to turn to mush. <laughs> so, yeah. So that's federal. Um, let me see if it'll let me Google. Yeah, it's called GAAP, G-A-A-P. Yeah, the yellow, is it called the yellow book? So general accept, generally accepted accounting principles or GAAP. 
standards that encompass the details, complexities, and legalities of business and corporate accounting. Um, so the federal government requires that you follow those rules. And there's something called, I believe it's the yellow book. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, uh, here we go. Office of Justice Programs. There's a guide sheet. I think it, there's also a circular for it, right? So this is a fun little fact sheet you could print off. Um, it says what topics should be included for GAAP compliance, what types of accounting methods, what is GAAP. Um, so this looks like a good little fact sheet. That was on Office of Justice Programs. Um, let me see if there's a, I think there's a um, guidance uh, circular, isn't there? Yes, here we go. Circular A3, A-134. So that is the circular with all the rules and policies. Uh, that one isn't the actual circular. Whitehouse.gov. So here we go, this is the actual circular. So circular A-136 was revised May of 2023. That's the current policy and regulations. So that's the one I would use for checking that your accounting department is meeting all those rules. Okay. All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, let me know if this was helpful. Thanks, have a good day.